I want to welcome everybody to the services again this morning. Um, I always appreciate the fellowship and the time that people spend together and uh, working with one another. It's one of the things that I believe is truly valuable about the church and about how uh, it's supposed to function. Uh, this morning, you know, if you were here during the history of Christianity, we talked about John Wycliffe and his desire that people would understand the Bible. Such, such forth that one of the things that he did was he actually translated the Greek, or the Greek New Testament into English so that people could understand it. Because he wanted people to understand it for themselves. See, what had happened was is there were a lot of traditions that were being taught and things that people had just always been kind of brought up knowing and saying this is what this means and this is only what it means. You know, there was no more further depth than just, you know, the surface of what the church leadership would tell you. And along with him and Husk, one of the things they determined is that the church is not just about the leadership but about the people that are involved because the people should be studying the scripture and coming up with the context themselves. Um, it's amazing to me that throughout the history of um, God's people and God's love for us and his creation, whether it's Moses, whether it's time of the prophets, God is always there. He's always there and his spirit's always there helping people understand and he's communicating to them and he's, he's spending time with them and saying, I want you to know the deeper meaning. You know, one of the interesting things about you know, the suffering servant inside of uh, Isaiah is that it's actually considered what's dual, considered to be dual prophecy because there was going to be something that happened right then that Israel was going to have to be facing, but then there was also something that was to come. And so there's dual, what they call dual prophecy, right? And so there's always these deeper things that we can study and the scriptures become deeper and more related to Jesus Christ because that's really what it's about is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, I'll tell you, the amazing thing about studying Scripture and, and developing a relationship with God and Christ and the Spirit is that the deeper you get in this relationship, the more you understand. I've often said this, and I'll say it again. I've read through Scripture, you know, a hundred times, and then on the hundred and first time, I learned something new. Now, I don't know why that always, how it works, but I believe it is partially is the Spirit working in the lives of us saying, hey, now today is the day that you've experienced the certain things in life that you needed to experience so that today it's going to understand a little bit more. Uh, and so one of the things I wanted to look at today was in Ephesians, and that's primarily around Ephesians 19, 519. And this passage oftentimes will be isolated, and it's been used to justify quite a few different things but I think there might be a deeper meaning that we can look at. And so I'll read it to you now, and it says this. Addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. I'll tell you, um, for some people, today's lesson might be a little more challenging because inside, it's really hard to be raised a certain way and to say this is, this is what this means and this is what it is and this is, this is how you'd understand it and then to break away. In fact, it's so hard that what we learned this morning in the history of the church is that John Husk was actually burned at the stake. And not only was John Husk burned at the stake, that they were so infuriated with people coming up with a different conclusion and different context and saying, wait a second, maybe the, maybe the traditional context isn't, isn't where it's supposed to be, that they went and dug up the bones of John Wycliffe and they burned them at the stake too. His bones. They burned his bones because they were so mad. I'll tell you, tradition in itself is not a bad thing. However, when the tradition allows, stops you from actually growing closer to God, or you settle on a tradition instead of developing a relationship with Jesus Christ, it becomes a hindrance. So sometimes people say, well, Theo, why... Why do people do this? One, a tradition is very comfortable. Uh, if you're in a tradition, right, it's very comfortable because you, you know what's going to happen. You know, like when you come in here, you know that we're going to sing one or two songs probably, right? 
Then we're going to have the Lord's table. And we're going to have a meal together. Then we're going to sing another song, and then we're going to do what? Do our offering. And now we're going to shake hands, and then you're going to listen to Theo talk for hopefully you know less than an hour. All right? I'm going to really try today. I'm going to really try. No, so we, we have that tradition, and so that makes us feel comfortable. But if that tradition changes, right, then we get uncomfortable. And it doesn't allow, sometimes tradition, when we get locked into such a tradition of doing things, it doesn't allow any real growth. It stunts the growth. You know, school systems, and I love the school systems. I do not knock on public school systems. But public school systems are set up on what? Wes, you have to teach certain things, right? And this is these are the areas you have to cover. So what happens if you have a kid that's further behind? And just continuing on and hoping that kid catches up. Yeah, I mean, try to bring them along with you if you can. And what happens if you have a kid that's so far past? And I'm hoping everybody kind of picks that up a little bit because what we're talking about different ends of the spectrum, right? And somewhere along in the middle, you try to you try to bring people along, but oftentimes the person who's really advanced kind of loses interest because they know it. The people who are left behind, well, they just kind of struggle to stay along the ride. And then there's the middle ground, but you're pretty much like locked into this thing. Now, how cool would it be if you had enough time, right? And I hope everybody who's listening to this recording can hear hear this. How cool would it be, guys, if Wes had the ability to teach each kid, right, at their own pace? And Wes could be engaged, in, and this is not a knock on you, man, because I know you try, because I've seen you blow stuff up, and I love it. Um, hey, if anybody's listening to this, we're talking about science experiments, Okay. Science experiments. Let me put a disclaimer out there for Wes. I don't want the FBI showing up at your house. No, but 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 with these, how cool would it be, Wes, if you had enough power and enough time to be able to engage each student individually, and yeah, and that you could work with them. I mean, it'd be awesome. It really would. That is what's so great about the spirit. The spirit is able to work in each individual's life and take as much time as necessary. And bring them along when they want to. Now, listen, people can be rebellious and say, you know what, Wes? I don't want I don't want you to teach me. Jesus, I don't want you to teach me. I am happy being right here where I'm at, and that's it. Because I've seen so many kids with so much potential, and you know what they do? They don't actually go after that potential. They don't actually go after seeking more knowledge because they're satisfied with where they are. What I'm going to tell you is you should never be satisfied in your relationship with Jesus. You should always desire more. Because following the tradition, the third reason why people follow traditions is because it's easy. It truly is easy. If your walk with Christ is waking up at uh, 8 o'clock on a Sunday morning and being here by 9.30 for the class and then staying for the lesson and that's your walk in with Christ, that's pretty easy. It, it really is. Because all you really got to do then to follow Christ is have an alarm clock. But if your walk with Christ, right, involves engaging one another, talking to one another, serving one another, going to somebody that you don't really care for and saying, you know what, it doesn't matter. The gospel is for you too. That is a lot more challenging. And so what I wanted to challenge us with is this Ephesians 5.19. And because uh, it's a very popular verse, you know, I know you guys have heard the arguments on it and everything. And this is not a debate. It's not an argument. If you totally disagree with everything you hear today, that's fine. Because all I'm going to do is just kind of bring it into context and maybe see if we can't figure out a deeper meaning for that passage. Well, this, of course, passage comes from Paul's epistle to the Ephesian church. Now, Ephesus is this really important city in history. In fact, they have a coliseum, right, and a theater that houses 20,000 people. 
Okay, it's huge. It also, during this time, uh, it housed the Temple of Artemis, which is one of the seven ancient uh, world, world, uh, what's the word? World wonders, thank you. It's one of the seven ancient world wonders that are out there. And so this is a very important city. And Paul spends a lot of time there in Ephesus. In fact, he spends about three years there spending time with the church and, and working with them. And this is happening anywhere between 52 to 57 AD, right? We don't really know the exact time frame, but we can kind of narrow it down into that area. Well, you know, after Paul leaves, you know, he goes into imprisonment. And around 62 AD is when he's going to write this letter to the Ephesians. And really what Paul is trying to do in this letter to the Ephesians is he has two main points that he's trying to get it across. And I'm telling you, these are the two main themes universally accepted about Ephesians. The first is this, is that Christ has reconciled all things to him. And the second thing is, is that Christ has united people from all nations to him and to each other. To him and to each other. So when we write a letter, you know, and I'm, and I'm penning you a letter, there's a purpose behind what I'm writing to you. Okay, there's a context to my letter. And I'm writing this letter in such a way so that you will understand what I'm trying to talk to you about. Now what becomes confusing sometimes is when people read the letter that the letter wasn't intended for. Because then they're like, well, what, what exactly does that mean? And so that means you've got to dig in and try to figure it out. And so the way we do that is by trying to understand what the context and the purpose of the letter was. And that's why I tell you, with Ephesians, it's important that you understand that those two things are what unites Ephesians. The epistle to the Ephesian church is the unity of Christ with us and others. And that the fact that Christ has reconciled all things to him. He's done the work. In order to support this type of uh, argument, right? And not that it's an argument. Paul loved the Ephesian church, right? Um, but the discourse that he has to go through is he's going to suggest to us six different things. And so what you get with the Ephesian letter is that you get the usual greeting, right? That happens in that type of literature and Greek letters. It's seen not just in epistles that are in the church, but in other forms of Greek writing too, that this is how they greet one another, very formal. And then they're going to go ahead and they go into a time of praise for the Lord. But then in chapter 2, he begins six discourses. Now I'm going to tell you, one of the things that I'd like to try to do with Scripture is I like to try to outline it a little bit. When we outline things, it begins to kind of help you shape things. And one of the easiest ways to outline things is when, especially with Paul, because he says, here's this, therefore. Here's this, therefore. It's great, because what he's telling you, here's the fact, therefore, here's your reaction to it, or what it should be. And so what I'd give you is that in these six things that he's trying to talk to about Christ fulfilling God's plan is these things. And I'll, and I'll give them to you real fast because it's not really the focus. But if you're looking for these, the first discourse is in chapters 2 10. In which time, during that section of Paul's letter, he talks about raising people from the spiritual death to life in Christ. In chapter 2, remaining in chapter 2, in verses 11 through 22, he talks about the reconciliation that happens between Jews and Gentiles at the cross. Now, Gentile, right, what I want to do is take you back to that Greek word because it's ethnos, right? Or, and look, somebody's going to be listening to this and be like, your Greek is horrible. It's okay, work with me, okay? But ethnos is not just a meaning Gentile, but it means a foreign people. So basically, the Jews and everybody else Right, the reconciliation that comes at the cross in Jesus Christ. The next section is then in chapter 3, and this is usually uh, outlined between verses 1 to 21, but it talks about the formation of one body being called the Ecclesia. And this is a time when he's talking about the unification of the church and what was, what was created by all these people coming together. Then in chapters four through one through chapter four, one through six, it's about maintaining unity in the church, about being together, about functioning together. 
not allowing your differences to come, come between you, but to be able to function with unity. And then that leads way to his fifth discourse, which is in chapter 4, and it starts around verse 7 to 16, which talks about taking the gifts of the Spirit and manifesting them for corporate worship, for the ministry or for the betterment of the church, the, the edification of the church. But then this is where it gets kind of interesting. Paul's sixth section that he starts talking about starts basically around chapter 4, 17, right? Verse 17. And then it goes all the way to chapter 6, 9. And so the majority, right, a good section of Ephesians is dedicated to this ideal, right, of Christ, God's plan in Christ is fulfilled by attainment of a Christian change of morality. Right? And it's accomplished through radical change. So Paul takes a good section of Ephesians, right, of this letter, and he dedicates it to saying, you need to have a radical change in your life. Because being a Christian means that you're going to move into a different thought process. And that thought process should actually generate different things in how you interact with one another and how you talk, about, talk to one another. You know, and so this verse that we read here, addressing one another in psalms and in hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart, that is part of this section talking about radical change. Now, this again, I told you, this is not a debate about whether or not to have instruments or not have instruments or to do this or to not do that. Personally, I'm really past a lot of that. And I'm not going to get hung up on it. Because what I want to do is I want to dig for the deeper meaning on it. In fact, what I really want to do is I want to keep that passage, that one, that, that one what we consider to be one verse, in context with what Paul said, I'm going to write to you over two chapters about. Because when we pull it out of context, all of a sudden we sit there and we say, what? well, that, that can mean this. And that's fine. I'm not saying that's a bad thing for you. If that's where you're at, then that's fine. What I'm asking you to do is dig deeper to see what Paul is trying to communicate to the Ephesians. though, And listen to what he's saying here. Because I'm going to tell you, as the debate goes between instruments and not musical instruments, that is a wide spectrum. You know, over here, around 1850, right, we get Ephesians, we get people reading Ephesians 5, 19, and Remember, during the 1850s is when there was the big crossroads whether or not the Spirit worked in individuals' lives or whether the Spirit was just working through the Scripture. And so there's a crossroad that's taking place during this time frame uh, around 1850. But what's going to happen is you're going to get a wide spectrum. You're going to get people over here that say no, and you're going to get people over here that say yes. Now, along this spectrum, right, you get a lot of different things happening, you know, and a lot of discussions that take place. And, and remember, Paul, prior to even talking about any of this, is talking about unification of the church. And he's talking about it in chapter 4, not allowing small divisions to come amongst you. It's schisms. Like we talked in the history of Christianity about the Western church going to the Eastern church and killing them. That's a pretty huge division, right? That's huge. And so along the same line, right, we, we get into these discussions sometimes of like, okay, well, okay, we, you can have instrumental music if you want to, or you can not have instrumental music. That's whatever you want. But then there's people who actually will take this topic and they'll, they'll take it and say, this is an issue of salvation. Now, what I'm challenging you to do is kind of open your mind up a little bit today as we talk about this with the letter of Ephesians, and you don't have to agree with me on anything. But I've heard a lot of things. I've heard things like, well, you can have instrumental music and it's okay to listen to like 104.9 or Joy FM or, or Spirit FM. And it's okay to listen to those instrumental songs on the radio, but you can't listen to them in a church building. Right? I've heard arguments that say that while you can't listen to those, it's okay for you guys to listen to country music. Now, I like country music like anybody else, right? I mean, I do. But then we start thinking about the deeper theological thoughts on those, and we say, well, what, what's the message that's being communicated when we listen to this music, and what's going into our mind? 
So what we're saying sometimes is that it's okay for us to hear songs about drinking, sex, um, and my cat dying and my dog dying, right? Because that's how's the old joke go? If you take a if you take a country record and you spin it backwards, you get back your wife, your life, and your dog, right? You know. But you know, I'm, we're working. Lillian's learning guitar, and she says, "I'm not playing no country music." You know? Like, yeah, you will. But but you know, we're okay with people listening to this, right? And saying, "Okay, it's okay to me to listen about a guy." You know, cheating on his wife and running around and, you know, getting drunk. But it's not okay for me to listen to an instrumental song about Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made. And it's okay because what ends up happening here is a lot of that's tied to a tradition that we're taught for year after year after year after year. And it's hard to break away from that. And so really, some of the best ways that we can kind of see if those things hold true is to measure them against Scripture. And really, that's why I think it's kind of interesting when we go all the way back, right, to this letter, Paul talks about there's these three things that mark a Christian. One is unity, one is maturity, and one is morality. That's those different discourses and how you can kind of even take them in easier to uh, put them together. You know, when you don't have unity, that's clearly seen. Not having unity, that's easy to see, right, because people are going to be fighting. You want, to, you want to know why people are disinterested in the church in general and seeking God? It's because people fight over the stupidest things. And I'll call them stupid. Because they are. In the bigger picture of things, hey, congratulations Israel, Isaiah says, you've done everything right. You've hit all the sacrifices and you've done everything that you're supposed to do. But guess what? God ain't pleased with you. Because you didn't take care of widows and orphans. Right? See, there's much more to, to the, this than just saying, well, we all you either conform or you get out. You know, conformity equals unity, which is not true at all. Unity is something much deeper. Maturity. Maturity is not always apparent, apparent either because it's a gradual growth, right? I'm 42 years old and I'm still immature, right? I mean, she's seen me in the. She's seen me at breakfast table. She knows. I'm still immature, man. I'm still got a lot of maturing to do. But it's a gradual process. And so, as you look at a maturity, it's not just something that happens overnight. It's a gradual process that goes on. And so, that's not always apparent to people to to say, okay, that person's maturing. But it's called to. But immorality, on the other hand, the other aspect of what what Paul is talking about, and and I call it immorality, but let's talk about refusing to um, take on a radical change in your life. That's very apparent. When immorality is exposed, it's clearly seen. I mean, it is clearly seen. Because people can observe it. And people outside the church can observe it. And so while Paul goes into this section of this chapter, or in this discourse, you know, and, and again, this section of, of the, if you're going back and you're trying to outline this, I'm looking at chapter 4, 17, and I'm going through uh, chapter 6, 9 of Ephesians. we got to back up here a little bit and kind of start here. And, and Paul is going to begin to say these things, but in 4, 17 through 19, he says this, he says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. They have become callous, have given themselves up to to sensuality, greedy to every practice and every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned from Christ. Now listen, I'll tell you, people are often confused when they go up and they start talking about Jesus to other folks and they say, hey, let me tell you about Jesus and why you should come to church. A lot of that times is because there's such a misunderstanding, right? Um, You know, that there's such a different education that's been presented to them on Scripture. 
that they just don't know who this Jesus is. And I think a lot of that has to do with Satan's influence. Some of it has to do with the hardened heart, meaning that they're just going to be resistant to it. There's a lot of multiple reasons why they lack perspective. Hey, there's even the idea that Satan is directly stopping them from learning. Now, we don't see that example here, but it's in other parts of the scripture that we see this engagement. Again, that's not listed here, but there's all these different reasons. But what I tell you, one of those reasons is, is when somebody's trying to figure out why you should follow this Jesus and two people can't get along from two different congregations, then there's a problem. There just is. I'm not saying that there can't be focuses, different focus, but when two people come together, right, proclaiming the name of Christ, when the Western church and the Eastern church comes together, if somebody saw those, those individuals come together and kill each other, both wearing the name or the cross on their chest in the name of Christ, why would anybody want to be part of that? If you're proclaiming Christ, but you're not proclaiming change in your life, why does it make a difference then? My time is limited. So Paul says here that, hey, don't 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 be divided. Understand where you're coming from. Because without radical change, here's what's going to happen. And and we see this in Colossians three, too, right? He kind of talks about this putting off of the old and the for the new. And we read it in Romans, too. But the first thing is a futility of thinking that comes from the mind. When we don't have radical change, there's a futility of thinking. A darkening of understanding. In Romans, they call, he calls it the heart, the changing of the heart uh, in chapter 1. And then being given over to impurity. So it's a process that begins. So why does Paul have to remind the Ephesians church, Ephesian church about this? You know, I said right here we have this, this verse that we, we look at quite often. And, and one of the first things he's talking about is the need for radical change. Keep it in the context. Why does Paul say that to the Ephesians? Ephesians are doing pretty good, right? I mean, he's talking them up and they're doing good. Lest we forget in Revelations that John, later on, has to explain to them and write, write in Revelations that, hey, guess what? You guys have lost your first love. See, it doesn't take very, very long from 62 AD approximately to the time of John's writings, around 100 AD, some would say, or or earlier in the 90s, that somewhere along in there, they lost their first love. They lost the focus of Jesus. Because now in the next section of this, right, in chapter 4, 20 through 24, we get the basis for that radical change. See, if if we lose the basis for our radical change and for what we're trying to go toward, which is Jesus, the first love, Then guess what? We get off track. Let's see what the scripture says there in verses 20 through 24. You're following along. And here it goes right with that language again about that clothing. You're going to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and be renewed in the spirit of your minds. You're going to put on a new self created in the likeness of God and trueness, true righteousness and holiness. Right? So here's this language. I'm taking off. I'm taking off my old self. I'm putting on the new. You know, and now when we start talking about that, this radical change, right? It's not just a change of, of uh, I'm going to put on some different clothes. It's a change of your attitude. It's a change of your life. It's a change of how you interact with people. In fact, everything that you're going to do now is going to be a, a way of life, right? So you talk about changing the way of life. Because it's no longer going to be good enough, right, just to say, hey, I'm going to practice these superior religious beliefs. You've got to have a relationship with Christ. Because without that relationship, remember he he has talked about the unification of the church, unification and reconciliation, remembering the two themes, reconciled everything to Christ, and unity amongst Christ and to others. That with that, that whole concept right there, that one of the things he's going to talk about is that you have to have a relationship with Jesus. Because he says you heard and you were taught. Right? Heard and taught. 
What's interesting about that, that means that they understood the process of conversion. And he doesn't talk about just, you know, you were, you were taught this, but it's almost like an ongoing way of life that you can actually say, hey, I'm going to forget about seeking that Jesus Christ and I'm going to fall into being okay with just having these superior religious beliefs. But we read earlier, what ends up happening, though, is when we don't have a relationship with Christ and Christ isn't the basis for what you're doing, there becomes the futility of thinking, the hardening of the heart, and then giving over to immorality. There's got to be a basis. And so this Jesus Christ has to be the basis of all this information. Now I'm going to tell you, preachers are, man, that P does pop, doesn't it? Preachers are always looking for good illustrations, okay? I'm telling you. They're like, man, i got to find this really good illustration so that everybody understands. Well, what's cool about the section of this passage is Paul shifts to examples for us. So what you're going to see in chapters 4, 25, all the way through chapter 5 and 2 are these different examples that Paul talks about. And remember, he's saying, here's the basis for your foundation. And then remember, we look for the therefore, and that therefore says, now it's time, this is what you're going to start doing. And that starts here in chapter 25, or in verse 25, excuse me. Because he says, therefore, having put away falsehoods, let each one of you speak the truth with with his neighbor. We are all members of one another. Here you go, verse 425. Radical change, if you have the basis of Jesus Christ, radical change, verses 425 says this, you're going to replace falsehood with truth. See, you're not just going to get rid of telling lies, you're going to embrace the truth. And let me tell you, that's hard. And and people are like, so what you're saying is i got to tell my wife that her cooking is horrible. No, I'm not saying that. Right? I'm not telling you that. No, listen. What I am saying, though, is being honest with people and treating people honestly, that's difficult. That's hard. I hear all kinds of things like, well, that person is this and that and everything else. Well, guess what? The gospel is still for them. You know, my I'll tell you, my, my sister-in-law's murderer, the gospel is still for him. But we've got to speak the truth. And the truth is, is that there, there has to be a radical change in your life. In verses 26 through 27, I'll read those to you. Because I'm just, I'm just reading you scripture now, right? This is just, just straight up scripture. Be angry. Do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil. we got to replace anger with forgiveness. Anger has to go away. The forgiveness has to come into play. And there's all kinds of different views on this, okay? Because what, what about righteous anger? And what about this and that? That's, that's all good and well, and I'm, I'm encouraging you to study those, right? But what you're talking about here is the same thing that we read about in Galatians 5.22. If there's a radical change, right, then, then anger, the Christian virtue that comes along with that, that opposes that, is patience. And that's generated from the Holy Spirit. It's, it's part of the package of the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so we can begin to see how 1850 really begins to play, right? 1850 AD begins to have a play on how we understand this passage. Because again, if you're, if you're talking about the viewpoint of the Holy Spirit working in people's lives, that means that inside of your life, as you mature, as Paul talked about maturity and his point in the marks of Christianity, that as you mature and as you embrace the Spirit more, you should be able to have the radical change of patience and forgiveness that comes with that. But if you don't, then you believe that that, that comes from only reading the Scripture. And we'll look at some more examples here. Well, here's one great great one, too. Chapter 4, 28. Let the thief no longer steal, but whether let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Check it out. Oftentimes, we'll talk about working. Right? And if you want to eat, you should. But check out what the deeper meaning is there. 
Paul says, I don't want you guys to go to work so that you can feed yourselves. I want you guys to go to work to feed others. Now, that doesn't mean people should be taking advantage of it, right? But, but understand, the, if you've been blessed with wealth, then, then your responsibility is greater. Because those whom much has been given, much is expected. But the radical change says, is, says that the thief is no longer going to steal from somebody. The radical change says he's going to go to work and start giving to people. Man. That is a radical change. That is, that is a difference. And then it continues to go on. In verse, in verse 29 of chapter 4, it says this, Let no corrupt talking come out of your mouth, but only such that is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear it. Check that out. A radical change means not only am I going to not talk, poorly anymore, I'm going to edify somebody. Now listen, we all get frustrated. There's a difference between venting a frustration and, and talking down to somebody and beating them down. You know, in this, in this world that we're living in right now, what's happening is there's, there's people who are afraid to let go of control. So they smack people around and they talk down to them. They call them names and they, they, they tell them they're not worth anything. Right? And that they're not, they're, you know what, you're, you're a horrible person. But guess what? What Paul says is in Ephesians that part of this embracing of the Spirit and of God and God's plan that was fulfilled in Christ is that you're going to have a radical change, that you're no longer going to do those things. Instead, when I talk to somebody, I'm going to edify them. Listen to me, parents. If you're not edifying your children, then you're failing them. Let me say it again so it's very clear. If you're not edifying your children, you are failing them. In a land, in a time of insecurity and unawareness and unsureness, if you're not the one telling them that, hey, you are loved and you are worth something because Jesus Christ died on the cross for you, then you are failing them. You're failing them. Guys, I know we get older, right, and we forget. You know, last, last week I was talking about how, you know, I, I forget sometimes what a young man or a young lady's emotional feelings are going through and the hormones that are going on with them. Because I'm past that stage, right? Um, I'm now 42, and i got a whole other group of issues. But, but I forget that emotion. Have we forgotten how insecure we feel? That if we don't get invited to the prom, how that makes us feel? Who remembers, who remembers this, right? When they picked sides for sports. Were you ever the last child? Do you remember, do you remember that hesitation going through and that, that gut feeling like, oh man, I hope I'm not the last one to get chosen. Now, after a while, I got used to it, right? But Because I was horrible at sports. I was good at wrestling, but horrible. You watch it. I gotta, for those of you listening on the recording, there's a peanut gallery up here in the front. I invite you guys to come meet them, but they're always harassing me. But, but what I'm getting at is that, remember that, go back to it. Close your eyes and think about that for a moment and go back to what it was like to be that kid, right? Now open your eyes because some of you are falling asleep on me. But I don't want you guys to fall out of your chair. You, but you probably, you just raised your hand because you're saying you've experienced that probably recently, right? Brother, I'm with you, man. I remember what that felt like. But what I'm telling you is that God loves you and that you're worth something to Christ. See, you've got to replace that unwholesome talk with edification. And listen, I'm telling you, I'm working on this one myself because I get frustrated sometimes. But as I mature in the Spirit and in Christ, I also have to mature in my radical changes. Because here's something really interesting. Check this out. Listen to what verse... Verse 30 says, because I believe it directly relates to what Paul is talking about when he talks about stealing from somebody and unwholesome talk, is he says this. Now listen carefully, guys. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Hey, listen. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit who sealed you. Man, I think it serves as a summary of the teachings. 
that our attitudes and our speech, right, to each other, if it's off pace, again, if this is the difference between 1850, if you believe that the Holy Spirit works in your life and that you are the temple and the Holy Spirit and dwells with inside of you, which the Bible teaches and it writes on, then imagine this. Imagine having the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you, but your attitude to attitude toward a, somebody else, another human being, is wrong. Talk about confliction and grieving. That is what I believe the grieving of the Holy Spirit is. You know, oftentimes, people are kind of like, you know, well, Theo, what do you mean by that? You know, and, and Paul even writes that he says that all Scripture, right, is what? It's beneficial. But people are like, well, Theo, how do you, how do you know that that grieves the Holy Spirit? Well, what I tell you is, let's, let's flip back to Isaiah, guys. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and find it. But Isaiah 63 uh, says this. Listen to what Paul is drawing into here. Because remember, Paul taught these guys. He lived with them for three years. And Paul loves going to Isaiah. But listen to what Isaiah uh, 63, chapter 63, verse 9 says. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. And in his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. Now listen carefully what I'm going to tell you. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Listen. They rebelled and they grieved his Holy Spirit. When we don't embrace the radical change that, that is to come with Christianity, and as we grow closer, we rebel against God. And it doesn't matter if the time period is the time of Adam and Eve when you know, Adam and Eve rebelled against God and disobeyed, or the time of uh, Isaiah when, when, when people of God, Israel, actually Judea, was, was rebelling against God. And it doesn't matter if it was the time when Paul wrote in Ephesians when people were rebelling and not wanting to conform to the radical change, or it doesn't matter if it's September 23rd, right? 2018, and we're rebelling against the radical change. It is grieving the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't want that for us. God does not want that for us. God wants us to have this life that's blessed. But when we refuse to embrace the radical change that comes with it, and we remain in our old self, then we don't get that. You know, it's real easy for victims of, or observers of people who have been spiritually abused to look and say, hey, man, I don't want no part of that because he can see what Paul is addressing here. Because there's, there's times, right, that if they can't see the radical change, that they don't understand what makes you different than anybody else. And it actually hurts your testimony. There's been so many times when I've lost my temper when I was younger or older, or whenever, that it hurt my testimony. It just does. And I, I've actually had to go to people and, I'm say, and tell them, you know what, I'm sorry you saw that. I hope you'll forgive me. I'm, I'm a human being and sometimes I get frustrated. But how I acted towards you wasn't right. Because Paul will go on in chapters uh, 4, 31 to 5, 2, and he'll start talking about replacing malice with things that are comprised of the Spirit. Um, you know, he gives you in verse 31, malice, bitterness, slander, rage, brawling. And then he, he opposes that with verse, verses uh, 32. And he says, there's going to be kindness. There's going to be forgiveness. These are the things, right? These are the things that you need to hold on to. Because this lifestyle over here doesn't communicate Christ. Instead, be kind, forgive one another as Christ has done for you. Listen, after verse 32, there starts this, this linguistic type of information that's provided to us that he repeats this three times. And so anytime we see that in this type of writing style that there's a repetitiveness of it, it's something we need to listen to. And really... It talks about in a manner like, in verse 432, uh, in a manner like Christ. 
which is the Greek word kathos, right? Which is a way of life, a preceding way of life. And then in verses 5-1, when he talks about imitator, it's that back half of that word, hos. And then in 5-2, it goes back to kathos again. And so it's talking about imitating life. And this morning we talked a little bit about imitating, right? And we said that today, if somebody something was an imitation, it'd be counterfeit. But back then, it was the highest form of, of honoring somebody to imitate them, right? To honor Christ means to imitate him, to be part of him, to follow the best example. That was honorable. And three times it's given to us. And it's not given to us, right, as just a past tense thing, it's given to us as a present tense thing, as something that's to go on. A almost, let's say, we said changing the way of life. Well, let's say to proceed in life. It's a way that you're going to act. Um, the next one is in five one five two, and you're going to see this. I'll just read it to you real fast. It's pretty amazing here. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So in verses 5, 1 and 5, 2, you're going to see this Greek word. It's per pata eto. I'm going to try that again because I'm sure I stuttered it out. Because the right? Per pata eto. Right? And it's an employed verb, Right? that talks about a way of life. And we say walk here, but really the better translation of that word would be to live. To live this way. To live in love. Because Christ has loved. The fragrant offering, that's another reference to kind of the Old Testament. Right? And when they would have these fragrant offerings. And it's not meant that there's some other means of sacrifice that allows you to be able to, you know, satisfy God because that only comes through Christ but it is a way of life the Hebrew writer in 13.6 right, says this, let me flip over here to you he says through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that in the fruit of the lips the acknowledgement of his name do not neglect doing good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God listen to the language there because let us continue. Let us continue in this way of life. I'm going to move that out of the way. I, I think this is in the wrong spot. I'm not always good at lighting up on a whiteboard. If you want to know what we're talking about, listening to the recording, you've got to come see my whiteboard mess. You know, in this, this verb, and the tense of this verb, suggest, suggests almost a continuing pattern in the way that you live. So Paul is saying that all these things that I just talked to you about, all these radical changes in the way of life and the proceeding in life and continuing in it, this is a a pattern of life that you should be living. And this fragrance, right, when they use this fragrance, it's drawing from the Old Testament, but it's about doing good for others. It's the horizontal action as well as the vertical action. Because after this, Paul is going to go on in chapter 5, verses 3 through 14, and he's going to go ahead and start talking about more immorality and more suffering and more, you know, going against God and rebelling against him and more of these things that you need to change, like sexual immorality and some other things. But in verse 15, right, and he's referencing, he goes into referencing uh, Isaiah 60. You might want to write that down and take a look at that later. But he goes back into this Greek word, this peripaeo, to live. But what's interesting is that in that section, he starts really introducing the power of the Holy Spirit, which allows you to live. But it's not something that just happens once. It's an ongoing thing. Because the present tense, the way he's communicating in that Greek, does not say it's a one thing that happens, but it's a continuous process, a continuous way of life, of living and interacting with people. Because then in verse 15 through 21, he, saw, he just comes right out and he says, you need to be careful how you're living. Right? You need to be careful how you're living. He says, not unwise, but make every opportunity. He says, not foolish. And listen to what he says to do in verse 18. And this is where we, 
we, you know, this whole context really starts kind of coming together because he says this. He says, not unwise, but wise, not foolish, but filled in the Spirit. Filled in the Spirit. Again, what we kind of see is in the present tense there, uh, that Greek word is pleuro, and I know I'm butchering my Greek. I, I only got a B minus in that, so just work with me. But it's not a one-time feeling that happens. It's not the Spirit comes in and fills you the one time and then he's done. It's the Spirit comes in and it creates a, a new pattern of life, a new radical change that takes place. Because starting in verse 19, which is our popular verse, right? Because we often leave that off, right? Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, right? Don't get drunk, don't be foolish, be filled with the Spirit. Oh, and watch here, here's the conjunction. Are you ready? Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Goes on to say, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. See, all this radical change embraced by the basis of Jesus Christ and the power of the Spirit should have some joyful results. Now often this passage has been used to say, this, see, this is why we don't have musical instruments. It's because it says that you are to sing. But what, let me break this down to you a little bit. Because what we talk about here is determining whether the context of that passage is in worship or the context of that passage is in the way of life. How do you live your life? And Paul, all the way up to this point, has talked about the radical change of the Spirit and how it changes your life. And so I think there's a deeper meaning than just saying, oh, this is why we don't have musical instruments. I, listen carefully here, because this Greek word here, this leo, it's actually a Greek word for, that's used there in that passage about communicating and preaching. It's about engaging one another. And so it's not just about the physical singing, but it is about the engagement of one another. Let me ask you a question. How much engagement goes on when you're singing to the back of somebody's head? That's right. Probably zero. How much engagement goes on? And so when we talk about, when we talk, start talking about the concept of singing and psalms and praise and engaging one another, it's more than just a song that you're going to sing. It's about how you engage each other as a way of life. Because if you've had these radical changes by the Spirit that Paul has gone on and on and on and taken the majority of the Ephesians to talk about, then it should have a result of joy. It causes you to want to engage with somebody. And the engagement arises from the heart, not just from a song that we sing. You know, there's a lot of people can even debate, well, what's the difference between a psalm and a singing and hymns? And I'm less interested in that than you understanding that the engagement and the joy that comes from that comes from your heart from within. Because when it comes from within, right, that is where the true love of God can be seen. The action of the Spirit that we see those radical changes. And I mean, it's talked about late earlier when he talks about kind of unholy talk a little bit. Contrast that with what he's saying here. He's saying earlier, he says, I don't want you to have unholy talk with each other. But here he contrasts it and says, now I want you to engage each other in such a way that it comes from your heart and that you find joy engaging one another and communicating with one another because your way of life is so different that you find joy in spending time with each other and, to, and to honoring one another. And the focus of that engagement when we come together and you're talking to one another and you're having the wholesome speech, the edification speech, and the time of joy, it, it gives us then a production of thanks to God. Listen to carefully again here, because I'll, I'll read it to you again. Right? Addressing one another, be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, giving thanks always for everything that God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus did. The engagement is just not honoring God, but it's also something that we do in the name of Jesus. And so what that really does is it kind of links us back to the difference between kingdom life 
and it reverse contrasts verse 5, which we looked at earlier, and verses 14. Because now they're suggesting that you're no longer part of something else. Right? You're not part of the world anymore. You're part of the kingdom. The part of the kingdom life is this. You know what? Let's go to Isaiah 60. Because I, I said that he made reference to that, but I want to read it to you real fast here. Because I want you to listen to what he says here. Arise. And this is talking about the future glory of Israel, right? God's people. He says, Arise and shine forth. Your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And for behold, and for behold darkness shall overcover the earth and the darkness of the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and the kings to the brightness of your rising. See, there was a, there'd be a change in how they acted what their focus was going to be on. And this change was going to come and it was going to be a new kingdom for them. And part of that result of that change then leads on into the rest of Ephesians. Because now not only is that radical change that you need to have going to have effect in, in, on the basis of Jesus Christ by the power of the Spirit, but now also what's going to happen is it's going to change your relationship with others. Because Paul goes on to say this, Paul goes on to say that it's going to change your marriages. It's going to change your parenting. It's going to change the way you work. It's going to change how you interact with others. You see, if, if the focus here, right, on 519, talks about, again, a change with others, And how we engage others. And it goes on to talk even about how like marriages will change, parenting will change, how you work will change. Chapters right five, six. Now what if what if Ephesians five nineteen can be read a little bit differently? What if we can read that? And so instead of as we're walking along, instead of just saying this listen, this is it. This is what it means. So this is why we don't have musical instruments. What if we looked a little bit deeper and we said, I am going to sing and make sounds? And my way of life and how I engage other people and how I interact with them is going to bring honor and thanks to God because I live in the kingdom. And that's going to come from the melody within my heart. What if we actually looked at that and we said to ourselves, we've just went over all this time. Is there something more there? What's the context of that message? What's the, what was Paul communicating to him? Was he communicating at any time in there about what happens inside the church building? The answer is no. But what he was talking about is how you're going to change in the power of the Spirit. What he was talking about is how you're going to honor God and how it's part of God's plan. What he was talking about is how you're going to treat one another and how it's going to infiltrate into your heart so much that it's going to change your relationships with others. Look, I'm not trying to say somebody's right or somebody's wrong. What I am saying is that there's definitely a deeper meaning there that we need to look at. Paul's letter was about the unification of Christ, right, and the reconciliation by Christ. That was the two major themes. And so when we get outside of those themes, we can begin to look at the passages and pull them slightly out of context because there's so much more to be learned. And, you know, I jumped through the first five discourses of this letter. I encourage you to go back and look at it and see for yourself if Paul was talking about a way of life or if he was just talking about, hey, on Sunday mornings, this is what you got to do. I would challenge you to go back and look at those passages and say, Am I, is this empowered by my own action or is this empowered by the Holy Spirit? Because a lot of times the secessionists will say that the Holy Spirit no longer works inside your lives. And I get it. It's a hard thing to understand because you can't physically see it. You just can't. But the, all the language that's used in this passage talks and continues to talk about a way of life and that it's continuous. It's all in the present tense. It's not past tense. It's present tense. It's, it's, it's going on right now. And it's something that we can embrace. Now look, I've given you a lot of passages today. If you would like to take a look at my notes and Take a look at how I outlined that after services. You're more than welcome to. 
I'd be glad to share that with you. I'd also be able to give, share some more thoughts with you on it if you had questions, because I know there might have been some questions generated. But what I'm asking you to do is not just take Ephesians 5.19 and, says, and say, well, this is right or wrong. This is how I'm going to use it. But use it as a motivation to say that everything that I'm going to do is going to come from my heart empowered by the Holy Spirit. And if that's not happening for you, all I'm asking you to do is just pray to the Holy Spirit, Jesus our King and our Creator, and embrace it. Attempt to. Find the deeper meaning. And I get it that this may be against some of your all's traditions and how you guys were you brought up, and it's okay. I'm not expecting you to just be like, oh, I get it. I, I understand it now. But I, I challenge you to go back and look at that letter and see what it's really talking about. See what Paul was trying to communicate to us. Because the power of the Holy Spirit and the radical change is available to us today if we embrace it. And it's not something you can do. Because remember the first theme of the letter, Jesus has reconciled it all. You know, if you're having troubles here today and you're challenged and you're, and you're frustrated, you know, you can look, come forward and I'll be glad to pray with you. Uh, but the truth is you can go left and right. There's somebody there that's willing to pray with you too. There's somebody willing there to listen and to hug you and to tell you you are loved and it's okay. I understand your frustrations. It may take me a second to go back and kind of remember those time periods, but I, I can because I, I, I went through them too. It's there for you. And I tell you, it's the most beautiful thing when you begin to embrace it. And it's a scary radical change because you say to yourself, if I'm going to have this radical change, then that means it's going to change the way I behave and how what I'm used to. And I get it. It's scary. What I'm telling you to do is take a step out and trust that Jesus is with you. Trust that the Holy Spirit is continuously working in your life. And God the Father, the one who created you, is not like an earthly father who has flaws, but he is the creator of the universe. He designed you. Not only did he design you, he loves you, and he's interested in your life. All right, that's all I got for today. I know we got a song of encouragement. Do you want the headset? All right, you're just going to sing it. All right, listen, for those of you that uh, didn't make it in today, we, we miss you. We hope that you get a chance to come and visit with us. Uh, Sunday mornings, 930, we're going to continue on with the history of Christianity, and then we'll jump into the sermon after that and the, and the corporate worship service. All right, as, watch this as we stand and sing.